Paul Ingrassia has been a, a journalist and an author for some 45 years, and that's going all the way back to his days in college when he was, he was uh, uh, beginning journalism even while he was in school. Today, he's the deputy editor-in-chief of Reuters News Agency and is based in New Jersey, but he once lived here in Southeast Michigan when he was the Detroit editor of the Wall Street Journal. 1993, uh, he and Joseph B. White won a Pulitzer Prize for their beat reporting on the auto industry. In 94, Paul and Joe White published a book called Comeback, The Rise and Fall, excuse me, Comeback, The Fall and Rise of the American Automobile Industry. In 2010, Paul wrote a book called Crash Course, The American Auto Industry's Road from Glory to Disaster. It was about the recent unpleasantness here. Um, that is the bankruptcy and bailout of Chrysler and General Motors. But his latest publication that he's going to talk about today is a very different kind of book. Engines of Change focuses on 15 different cars, but it's not really a book about cars. It's about 20th century America as seen through the lens of those cars. One of the things that I loved about Engines of Change is the way it makes connections between cars and a variety of cultural and historical events. You have to be impressed when an author can make a plausible link between the 1960 Chevrolet Corvair and the election of George W. Bush as president 40 years later. Uh, more of these connections are reflected in one of my all-time favorite uh, titles for a book chapter. The BMW 3 Series, The Rise of the Yuppies and the Road to Arugula. I'll make one connection of my own between Paul's book and our newly opened automobile exhibit, Driving America. Thirteen of the cars that he features in Engines of Change are featured in Driving America, which I hope means that great minds think alike. And much like Paul's book, we try to use the automobile to illuminate larger themes and stories about America. We did not do a companion book to the exhibit, but it turns out that Paul has done one for us. So after you've bought the book and after you've gotten Paul to sign it, I hope you'll take a look at Driving America. Now after that unabashed plug, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul and Gracia. Well, thank you, uh, all of you, for, for being here, especially on Mother's Day. Uh, and I want to thank Bob for that uh, very generous introduction. He was kind enough to mention the, uh, the Pulitzer Prize that came my way back in 1993 when I was based here in Detroit. I have to tell you my fondest memory. Um, uh, my son, Charlie, who was then in, uh, uh, in junior high at the U of D Jesuit Academy uh, up the road here, went to school the next day. And he told his teacher his dad had just won uh, the Pulitzer Surprise. Uh, he was, in my case, he was about right, believe me. Uh, I actually owe Bob and the Henry Ford uh, uh, a, real, uh, a real special thanks, if you will, for another reason. A lot of the research for this book uh, was done here. Not all of it, but a lot of it was. And part of it was done by picking, uh, picking Bob's brain for ideas and just kicking around uh, ideas with him on winter afternoons over in the Michigan Cafe. Uh, a lot of it was done by digging into the uh, uh, archives of the Benson Ford Research Center, which has some really marvelous, uh, marvelous old automotive documents and, and things to go through, as well as other places here in town, the National uh, Automotive History Collection at the Detroit Public Library, the downtown branch of the library at the foot of Gratiot is, um, uh, was another place I did a lot of research. Um, so I'm, again, I'm really happy to be here, uh, especially on Mother's Day. I guess there are probably a few mothers in the audience. Uh, we're going to get into a particular kind of, uh, of uh, mother symbol, if you will, uh, during the course of this presentation when we get to the Chrysler minivan. So I'll, uh, we'll get there a little bit later. I want to just um, start by uh, showing you a list, if I can, of the, of the 15 cars that, at least in my opinion, had a defining impact on American life and thought. And it's very important to understand that when I set out to write this book, I decided I don't want to write a book about the best cars or about the worst cars. Uh, there's probably, I'm certainly more qualified automotive journalist to do that than me. 
I want to I want to write a book about cars that had a lasting influence on how we live and we think as a people. That was the key thing. So some of these cars are great cars, some of them are not great cars. Uh, and, and the other thing I really wanted to do was get get I, get ideas that were reflected through our society that gave, gained expression uh, in automobiles, if you will. But I also started by taking a step back from automobiles and saying, if you forget about cars for a minute, what, what, what sorts of things would reflect the kind of tug of war culturally we've had in our society, which has really been a, um, uh, you know, for about the hundred years or so, we've had this tug of war between the practical and the pretentious, uh, the upscale and the downscale and all that sort of thing. And that has been a recurring theme of American culture, which is uniquely reflected and powerfully reflected in automobiles. Uh, and the other, um, the other uh, genesis, basically, for this book um, really came from years as a kid um, reading National Geographic magazine. Um, I assume people here have read National Geographic on occasion over the years. I mean, you, you get these articles about you know, what the spoons of the ancient Etruscans could tell us about the lives of the ancient Etruscans, okay? Well, I figured, you know, if, if spoons could tell us things about the, the lives and values of the ancient Etruscans, well, automobiles ought to be able to tell us something about how we live and think as a people. Now, it's going to come as no surprise that the first car in the, um, in the book is the Model T. Uh, this is a, a scene from the Highland... Um, Park, Forwards Highland Park plant, uh, circa 1920. Uh, the Model T, as probably many of you know in this room, this being a Detroit audience, was introduced in 1908. And it was called the Model T because it followed the Model N and the Model R and the Model S. So, pretty logical. Um, it, it started out with a price of $850. A very reasonable price for the day, but not the cheapest car on the market. Um, that went to a car called the Brush, uh, the Brush Everyman's Car, nicknamed the Brush Runabout, that had a, a lot of its components were made of wood, actually. In fact, its detractors uh, during the day uh, uh, sniped that the car had, a, had a wooden wheels, wooden axles, and wooden run. Uh, um, nonetheless, it actually was a pretty reliable car. Uh, Henry Ford really f followed the Model T five years later with the moving assembly line in 1913. And again, that's a familiar story to everyone here. And just uh, less than a year after he put in the moving assembly line, he started the $5 day, thereby uh, really paying a premium for workers, allowing them to buy his products, uh, setting the seed for American mass manufacturing, and really, in a way, the birth of middle-class America. Um, by 1924, uh, the price of the Model T was down to just $260 because he's, all these productivity improvements he kept passing on um, and uh, lowering the price to people. But the problem was he didn't change the car. He just loved his creation. He didn't want to change the car. Uh, and by the 20s, America was becoming a more urban society. Uh, and people started to desire automobiles not as just vehicles for physical mobility, but also as vehicles for social mobility. You wanted to signal your status in life. And along came General Motors and Alfred Sloan with a different idea. Um, and they, their car, the car that really signified where they were going was introduced in 1927, uh, the same year that the Model T was discontinued. Uh, and it was the LaSalle. It was the first Harley Earl car, the first mass market designer car. It was really the first yuppie uh, vehicle, if you will. And it really set the stage, uh, the contrast between the Model T and the LaSalle set this yin-yang contrast between the practical and the pretentious that have run through our automobiles and indeed our wider society for, for 100 years now. Those, by the way, are the only uh, pre-war cars in, in the book because, look, we had the Depression in the 1930s, we had World War II in the 1940s. Um, People weren't thinking much about culture. They were thinking about finding enough to eat and staying alive. And of course, um, automobile production, civilian car production was discontinued during the Second World War. So the factories of Detroit could be devoted to producing tanks and, and guns and, and uh, airplanes and that sort of thing. 
So the, really the threat of cultural evolution as reflected in automobiles picks up in 1953. Uh, it was a seminal year for America. It was the year that the Korean War ended. It was the year that Hugh Hefner started Playboy magazine. And it was also the year that Elvis Presley started recording music. And so you get this picture of an America, uh, of an America that really had known basically uh, depression and war, i.e. privation for 25 years. All of a sudden we had peace um, and people wanted to let loose a little bit. So along comes the Chevy, Cor uh, Chevy Corvette. And guess what? It was a flop. Uh, the car had an anemic six-cylinder engine, um, a very uh, uninspiring two-speed automatic transmission, and the roof leaked so badly that actually some GM executives of the day who got early Corvettes drilled holes in the floor so the, you know, the rain could sort of drain out of the car very gracefully, if you will. This was not a model for success, okay? As a matter of fact, a year after it was introduced, uh, the, the rumors started to spread through GM headquarters that the, uh, the car, uh, GM was going to discontinue the Corvette. And uh, the guy that rode to the rescue was a middle-level engineer, um, a Russian uh, immigrant, really. He was raised as a Bolshevik boy, born, uh, he was actually raised in St. Petersburg around 1909, 1910, and grew up during those years in Russia, during the years of the Russian Revolution. His parents, and later his stepfather, were Communist Party apparatchiks, if you will. And, uh, but he, uh, they were posted to Berlin in the 1930s. Uh, the Germans really, uh, war broke out. Uh, so Zora Arkus Duntoff fled with his parents and his wife, his new wife, and, and they fled to America. Uh, and in 1953, he started working for General Motors. And a year later, uh, when he hear, hears the Corvette is going to be killed, he writes these impassioned memos to, to senior management. If you go back and read them today, they're remarkable. They're sort of a blend of corporate jargon and immigrant English, okay, which is a, really an interesting uh, choice of language. English was actually uh, Duntov's fourth language. And he said, look, don't discontinue this car. You know, uh, Ford is about to come at us with a Thunderbird. If we give up now on our, our GM's baby, uh, we're going to be the laughing stock." So he won a reprieve for the Corvette, and it actually uh, went on to become the symbol of a great American, uh, a great American sports car. Uh, b these, by the way, were the Red Scare years and the, um, the Joe McCarthy years, McCarthyism in the early, uh, the mid-50s. What's ironic was uh, the House on American Activities Committee actually held uh, hearings in Flint, Michigan uh, back in 1954. And one of the people who testified was identified in the Detroit Times newspaper um, as a woman who was, quote, a Flint grandmother and an FBI spy. <laughs> sort of a unique combination, um, if you will. Anyway, uh, one can only imagine that if Senator Joe McCarthy had realized that a Bolshevik boy had risen, ridden to the rescue of the Chevrolet Corvette, uh, the Corvette might not have been the symbol of, you know, what, it, what every red-blooded American boy wanted. It might have been deemed some sort of a commie plot. Uh, but fortunately, uh, Senator McCarthy never caught on. They do not make cars like this anymore, do they? Um, and it's really quite amazing, tail fins. I decided this is the 59 Cadillac um, Eldorado Biritz, which had the largest tail fins that were ever appended to a vehicle that did not fly. And uh, it's really, the history of tail fins is fascinating. They started as very modest little upward protrusions on the fins of the 1948 Cadillacs. Harley Earl, uh, really the father of automotive design, was the one who first put modest fins on there. Uh, GM was so nervous about these at the time, even they were, they were very small little things, that it actually had plans drawn up for a new set of rear fenders without fins in case the finned fenders flopped, so to speak. Uh, but Harley Earl was right, the fins caught on. But they stayed small until about the mid-50s. And that's when Chrysler, under the direction of a, a visionary designer named Virgil Exner, uh, decided to put, put bigger fins on the, uh, on the back of Chrysler cars in an effort to regain market share. Because Chrysler was hurting at the time. Chrysler actually has been hurting a lot of times, but that was one of the times it was hurting. Um, 
So if, if you really go back in the, uh, uh, he was remarkably successful. In, 19, in 1955, the first year of the, the Exner larger tail fins, uh, Chrysler earned more money in the first two years, uh, first two months of the year, than it earned the entire previous year in terms of corporate earnings. Uh, and the company's market share jumped in just one year from 13% to 18%. So big fins were obviously an item. Uh, they were actually sold, believe it or not, as safety devices. I know you've got to be kidding me, but it's true. Uh, the old sales brochures of the day talk about tail fins as graceful directional stabilizers, like they were giant rudders. Um, that's a little uh, advertising hyperbole. Uh, but anyway, it was working. In 56, they came out with bigger fins. In 57, they came out with bigger fins. And that's when Chuck Jordan, in the summer, just before the 57 cars appeared, uh, got a sneak preview, an, un an unauthorized sneak preview, actually, of the 57 Chryslers. Uh, and he, he, up on Mound Road, basically, behind a Chrysler storage facility. So he hopped in his car, ran back to the tech center, and he ran into Bill Mitchell's office, who was then the head of design, or about to become the head of design. And he said, Bill, we're about to get out thinned, okay? Uh, so this was war. General Motors realized that it could not allow itself to be outfinned by this little upstart Chrysler. So Chuck went back uh, and, re and drew the car you see here. Actually, uh, I was fortunate enough to interview him uh, before his death about 18 months ago. Uh, but Chuck told me that the first clay model he did of this car, uh, actually, when he stepped back, he realized the tail fins were actually taller than the roof of the car. Uh, so what you're seeing down here, uh, out here is a scaled down model, actually, of what it could have been. But tail fins really became the sky's the limit uh, symbol, this limit of the sky's the limit ethos of the late 50s, when America was really uh, predominant. We had a little blip with Sputnik, but America was really the, the dominant country on Earth. And it was uh, all about optimism, if you will. And it was a fascinating symbol that really has endured uh, until this day, even in movies like uh, Tin Man a few years ago, starring Danny DeVito. But every action, as you know, spawns an equal and opposite reaction. And this is the equal and opposite reaction. This is the Volkswagen, which is the anti-Cadillac. Um, and I, again, it's, a, it's a really a fascinating story how Volkswagens went, the Beetle went from Hitler's car to hippie icon. I mean, you know, Hitler and the hippies didn't have a whole lot in common. Um, the original name of this car, which is actually decreed by Hitler himself, was the Kraft durch Freude Wagen, which means the strength through joy car. Okay, it's kind of a stupid name, but nobody wanted to argue with the Fuhrer. I don't, I don't quite know why. Um, Anyway, this got popular in America, really, when a few GIs in the post-war period start, were posted in Germany. They started driving it. They liked it. They brought their cars back. And then in 1953, Volkswagen starts sending a few Beetles over to America, not because it saw a huge market. Actually, they just needed to get dollars. They needed hard currency so they could buy modern machine tools. Uh, but the car caught on because it was an anti-Cadillac statement, if you will. So if you were... You know, if you were one of this growing group of American bohemians, as they were called in those pre-hippie years, who were, wanted to make a statement against conspicuous consumption, this is what you'd buy. And, and, and all this, this anti-establishment uh, image of the Beetle was reflected in really quirky advertising. I mean, who else would put a, an ad that said the word lemon on a car? I mean, it just was remarkable. Another of my favorite ads showed... Um, uh, you, some of you might remember Wilt Chamberlain, a, a, a well-known basketball player in the 1960s. He was seven feet tall. He was African-American. This is one of the first ads that actually featured an African-American. And it showed him trying to get into a beetle. And the headline was, they said it couldn't be done. It couldn't. Okay. Um, so there were very irreverent, funny advertisements. Uh, this one here for the microbus, actually the headline is, do you have the right kind of wife for it? Uh, it'd be remarkable to see an automotive advertisement like that today. And there's some other great ads, too. Let me just show you a couple more. Um, the one on the right was actually a real couple in the Ozarks who were living in 1971 in a log cabin. They were farmers. They didn't have running water. Their mule died, and they got a beetle to replace the mule. 
And Volkswagen found out about this, and they did this great American Gothic ad that shows the cabin, the Beetle, Mr. and Mrs. Hinsley. Again, these are not actors, they're real people. And you can see they're posing, right, American Gothic style. And the headline on the ad is, it was the only thing to do after the mule died. I mean, it's just very witty, offbeat, and different, and that's what really helped Volkswagen get its anti-establishment image. And of course, this really caught on, and when Jerry Garcia, uh, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the microbus really became the true hippie mobile, if you will, and when Jerry Garcia uh, died in 1995, Volkswagen took out a, an advertisement, a full-page ad in Rolling Stone magazine, and you can see it here with the microbus shedding a tear from one of the headlights. That's pretty cool, actually. General Motors had an answer to the Beetle. It was like the Beetle. It was rear engine and air-cooled. It was called the Chevrolet Corvair. And here are two covers of Time magazine that ran exactly a decade apart, uh, maybe 10 years and two months apart. The first one shows Ed Cole, uh, the general manager of Chevrolet at the time, in, Oct in October of 1959, when the Corvair was introduced. Let's put this in perspective. This was the first year of American compact cars. Two-car families were a rarity in America back then. And Ed Cole had the vision to say, you know, people don't need two full-size cars. They can have a full-size family car, but then a, a different model than the Corvair. Uh, like the Beetle, I said, it was, as I said, it was rear engine and air-cooled. Got 29 miles to the gallon. Remarkable for its day. Um, Ed Cole told Time Magazine in this article, he said, if I felt any better about our new Chevy Corvair, I think I'd blow up. Well, it was pretty ironic that he said that because actually the car, the car did blow up really in the face of General Motors. All that weight in the rear end caused, caused it to spin out. And there were a lot of Corvair accidents. Um, and all these were, became the passion of a young, frankly unknown and unemployed lawyer named Ralph Nader. Uh, and Ralph Nader in 1965 wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, and the first chapter was about the Corvair. Uh, the thing of it is, the book was a flop at first, uh, and nothing really happened until uh, it came out in a few publications, uh, including the New York Times, that General Motors had hired some private detectives to spy on Nader. And as a result, there were hearings in front of Congress. Jim Roach, the, the president of General Motors, went down to publicly apologize uh, to, to Nader in front of Congress. Uh, Roach, by the way, had, nothing, had no idea the spying was going on. That was all levels below him. Uh, one of the ironies is that Nader actually missed the apology because he did, he did not own a car and he couldn't get a taxi cab that morning. So he missed Mr. Roach's apology. Uh, but after that, the book became an overnight sensation. It went to the top of the bestseller list. Nader became an uh, overnight celebrity. Um, and really, the Corvair's days were doomed. Um, I think this car is probably the second most influential vehicle in American history after the Model T. So why is that? Well, for one thing, it created a whole new regulatory atmosphere by the American government toward business and the auto industry. For another thing, uh, the, the um, Corvair created the greatest growth industry of the late 20th century. That's called lawsuits, okay? I mean, the reason we have so many lawyers is, is due in no small part to this car. And finally, uh, 31 years after the car was killed in the election of 2000, uh, George W. Bush won the election in Florida, uh, election as President of the United States, and he won Florida by less than 2,000 votes. And that's what gave him that election. Do you all remember, you know, the hanging chads and that sort of thing? Uh, Nader got 95,000 votes that year in Florida. So it's very reasonable to assume that almost all those votes would have gone to Al Gore if Nader had not been on the ballot. And Nader would have been a nobody, certainly not on the ballot, if, if it was not for the Chevy Corvair. So uh, this car had a remarkable, long-lasting impact on American history. I think everybody knows this car. It needs no introduction. But there's something wrong with that picture. Can anybody sort of guess what that might be? The truth is, the Ford Mustang was not named after a horse. It was named after the P-51 fighter plane in World War II. And Ford adopted the horse symbol for it um, uh, later. Uh, but it was an instant success when it was launched in the spring of 1964. Nothing really quite captured American youth culture 
as much as the Mustang. Um, remarkably, though, the, um, the Mustang was basically a very attractive, sexy styling design put on the chassis of the, under, of the old Ford Falcon, which is about as dowdy as you can get. And uh, a Ford executive explained this to the Detroit Free Press by saying, well, basically, you know, we took a woman who was a librarian and we turned her into a sex pot. I don't think that kind of explanation would fly today in corporate America, but that's exactly what happened. Uh, the Mustang was really the product of three people, basically. Um, Lee Iacocca, Hal Spurlick, and um, the late Don Fry. Do remember those names. We're going to come back to those names a little bit later on, at least two of those names. But it captured baby boomers just as they were coming of age. They were getting their driver's license, they were going off to college, and so America's largest generation was captivated by this car. Uh, and it, it really was a hallmark of the 1960s. This is not Spock, by the way, okay? This is not Leonard Nimoy as Mr. Spock. Uh, this is John DeLorean, the creator of another iconic car, um, and that is the Pontiac GTO. Also came out in the 1960s, but it really caught a very different spirit in America, the rebellious spirit, just like, by the way, DeLorean himself. Um, you know, the, the early 60s, you can look at them and say those were the good part of the 60s. They were all about civil rights, uh, they were about the Beatles, and they were about the Ford Mustang. Along come the later 60s, when things started to go awry in our society, those were really rather different. They were about urban riots, including those here in Detroit. They were about the Rolling Stones, not the Beatles, you know, the bad boy band. And, of course, they were about the GTO instead of the, the Mustang. Um, the GTO really was not, you know, they, people were rebels, but they were not like Volkswagen Beetle rebels. These were like, you know, the hippies wanted to raise people's consciousness. I mean, GTO drivers just wanted to raise hell, if you will. So it was a very different sort of a, a thing. And, you know, DeLorean uh, left General Motors in 1973. Um, he, um, uh, after the GTO was a hit, he then on, went on to found his own car company, if you will, uh, the DeLorean Motor Company, which made the, the DeLorean car that actually starred in the movie. He was uh, accused of fraud, acquitted in federal court of fraud, frankly despite overwhelming evidence. And then he was accused of drug dealing, even though he was caught on tape selling cocaine in an effort to save his failing DeLorean car company. You know, most guys would have tried, you know, doing an IPO, junk bonds, whatever. He tried selling cocaine. But he was acquitted because the jury said the federal uh, the FBI tried to entrap him, uh, and he died a few years ago. He actually died in the, the hospital in the town where I, not li I now live, in Summit, New Jersey. Um, so it was a very sad end to his career. Uh, so here, here we go. We leave the 1960s and we go to the 1970s, and they were not a great period for America. Um, you know, we had uh, defeat in Vietnam, we had Watergate, we had uh, stagflation, we had two oil crises, Remember 73 and 79? You know, we had bell-bottom pants, we had disco dancing, all kinds of stuff that you'd rather forget today if you could. So again, going from the pretentious down to the practical, the, the societal pendulum, the automotive pendulum swung back, and it was really captured by a Japanese car more than anything else, and that's the Honda Accord. Um, the, uh, it was created, you know, Honda Motor Company was the creation of two individuals, one, very different personalities. Um, one is uh, Soichiro Honda, shown here, and on the far left is his finance man, Takeo uh, Fujisawa. They were very different people. They both had explosive tempers, uh, but Mr. Honda was sort of a Japanese party animal, while uh, Fujisawa didn't even drive a car. He loved to stay home at night listening to Wagner operas, if you will. Uh, but they had this vision of a simple, reliable car, high gas mileage, um, and it really, they, they introduced it in 1976 as the first Honda Accord. Uh, six years later, in 1982, they started building it, not in Japan, but in Ohio, Marysville, Ohio. It's 30 years ago this year. And it's a landmark year in American industrial history because uh, it's a, it was the first foreign car to be successfully built in the United States. And again, that was 1982. Seven years later, before the decade was out, the, the Honda Accord became the number one 
car nameplate in America. Uh, and it really, uh, really signaled a return to a much more practical, back-to-basics, uh, down-to-earth sort, of, um, uh, sort of mentality. Moving on, um, I told you we were going to get to motherhood uh, in this, on this Mother's Day presentation. Uh, this is not Sports Illustrated. This is Car and Driver when the Chrysler minivan was introduced in 1983. And it quickly became the unofficial symbol of the soccer mom, uh, who was thought to be a very potent political force in American politics. And again, this was created, you know, I, I mentioned the Mustang, uh, Hal Spurlick and Leia Coca. They created the Mustang in 64. 20 years later, they caught the baby boom generation again at another critical juncture in their lives. These same people who were kids when the Mustang came out, they, what they did was they went to college, they grew up, they got a haircut, they got, got married, they got a job, they had children. It wasn't always in that order, but that's basically what happened. And the Mustang was, the, I mean, the minivan was the perfect car for growing young families. In fact, my wife and I, had, we had three boys under the age of six then. God help us, I know. Um, but the, uh, the truth was it was really a great uh, family vehicle. We had one of the first minivans to come out in the fall of 83. Um, one of the funnier stories about this is in the mid-90s, it really became a, um, uh, it, it, the minivan became a symbol of the political force of soccer moms, and the New York Times and other newspapers sent out uh, uh, journalists to interview minivan driving mothers at soccer games, and they asked one um, mother at one game, well, you know, how does it feel for you to be a political force? And she said, look, I got to go home and thaw something out for dinner tonight. I don't have time to be a political force today, which I thought was a pretty good response. Um, these same baby boomers, by the way, the, the ones who were really weren't into their child rearing years yet, were, uh, were basically went into uh, the BMW 3 Series, which was, became the unofficial yuppie car. As a matter of fact, there was a black tie dance in San Francisco, a cotillion, uh, in, in 1985 where you had to wear a black tie with Nike sneakers to go to attend the dance. And they said the, they, uh, they ripped off the BMW logo, basically, unofficially, and said it stood for beauty, money, wealth. That's what yuppies were all about, right? Conspicuous consumption and, and showing off. Um, the whole yuppie thing stood for young, young urban professionals. And then after you were yuppies for a while, you became dinks. Remember what dinks were? Double income, no kids. And then uh, after dinks became, there became orchids. Orchids was one recent child, hideously in debt, okay? Uh, that's how it all, that whole alphabet soup sociology really reigned at the time. And uh, this, you know, yuppies wanted to show off like their parents did, they were driving Cadillacs, but there was a big difference. They were not into tail fin ornamental luxury, they wanted performance luxury, things you had to be sort of, only the cognizante could really truly appreciate it, like uh, vibration dampening Rosignol skis and all kinds of other high-tech sports equipment. And the BMW appealed uh, really to that. Uh, one of the uh, great bumper stickers of the day that was found on the back of many BMWs said, uh, he who dies with the most toys wins. It's kind of what yuppiedom was all about, really. Um, uh, BMW, actually, surprisingly, the, the, that yuppie image did not hurt the sales of the cars, it, and it really could have been very damaging to BMW over the long run. The, um, oops, I wanna, before I leave that, I just want to say one other thing about the BMW. One of the fun parts of the book was finding people who had been in hippies in the 60s during their college years. You know, they had long hair, and they played in a band, and they drove around smoking marijuana and, and VW microbuses. I, committing, let's say, vehicular herbicide, if you will. Um, but the, um, uh, 20 years later, some of these same people that I found in the research for this book uh, become yuppies driving, you know, BMWs. And it was sort of remarkable. So their, their personal journey was from hippie to yuppie, and their automotive journey was from beetle to beamer. It sort of traced, the, their autos sort of traced their lives, which was uh, really a fun thing to sort of relive when I, when I interviewed the, them about this for the book. Um, just a couple more here, two or three more. The, the Jeep started out life in, um, as a World War II vehicle, but it also became a very st 
status, uh, status symbol, a fashion symbol, if you will, uh, beginning around 1990. And what happened then? Well, you know, this whole outdoor, uh, outdoor thing was taking hold in America. You wanted to sort of pretend, uh, present yourself as a rugged outdoorsman. You know, even if rugged outdoors just meant the indoor rock climbing gym down the block, you know. Um, and you know, you had, uh, anybody here has ever seen the, J, the J. Peterman catalog, catalog and ordered anything from it? That really took off back then because all these things, uh, you know, Wyoming duster coats and cowboy boots and all that sort of went mainstream. And the Jeep did the same thing. Um, it was quite remarkable. Uh, L.L. Bean took a lot of its products that had been specialty, sport, specialty sporting gear, outdoors gear, and made mainstream versions of them. Uh, just like the Jeep uh, was, was mainstreamed. Uh, the old backpacks, if you look at them years ago, they were all teardrop shaped because they, they was better for, ergonomically better for long hikes. But what LL Bean, they wouldn't hold textbooks for school kids, so they squared off the backpacks to, to make them more mainstream. And Patagonia got very big during those years, and they made just all this mountain climbing gear, and they made colors like, you know, mocha and teal and all that, you know, tea rose and all that kind of stuff. So it was all bringing fashion to what had really been sort of just outdoor stuff. And the Jeep did that. It was a huge success. Um, the, um, it spawned this anti-SUV backlash for a while. Um, uh, you remember a few years ago, there was an evangelical group that, um, uh, you know, had an advertising campaign that said, uh, asked the question, what would Jesus drive? Um, I don't think there was any specific guidance in the ancient text about that. I think any, any reference to Jeep in the scriptures would raise some more fundamental questions, perhaps, if, if you will. Um, so here we go on to uh, the, the pickup truck, which was really, um, you know, again, like Jeeps, this was just a down and dirty work tool for years. And it didn't really go mainstream until about the 1970s when country music also started to go mainstream. Some of you might remember the Glenn, Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour, uh, and then the Johnny Cash Show, all started right around 1970. Country music really got to be um, uh, a mainstream thing in the 70s and 80s with Loretta Lynn, Johnny Cash, and people like that. And pickup trucks started going mainstream too. They're designer trucks. I mean, you can get, go down the road and get a Ford uh, you know, F-150 King Ranch Edition um, that is absolutely lavish. I mean, the, the seats have more leather than most cows, I think, honestly. Uh, pictured here is the Harley Davidson edition. And I really had a lot of fun writing this chapter because it gave me a chance to write about country music, which I really like. Um, Joe Diffie did a couple of great country songs about trucks. One was called Pick Up Man, okay? The double entendre is pretty obvious. My favorite is Leroy the Redneck Reindeer. You guys all know that one. It's about a reindeer who dashes to the North Pole in his pickup truck to save Christmas one year when Rudolph got, got sick on Christmas Eve. Um, pickup trucks also became, like minivans, a political symbol. Uh, 2010, the midterm congressional election, or, I'm sorry, the special congressional election in, in Massachusetts to replace the late uh, Senator Ted Kennedy's to fill his seat was won by a Republican, the first Republican that Massachusetts sent to the Senate in decades. His name was Scott Brown, and he made his mark by driving and campaigning around the state in his used GMC pickup truck. Uh, the night that um, he won election, uh, President Obama called him to congratulate him. And uh, the first thing that the senator said to the senator-elect said to the president was, uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. Do you want me to drive the truck down to Washington so you can see it? Um, it really took hold as a political symbol. Uh, ten months later, in the midterm congressional elections of 2010, uh, there was a guy running for Congress in Tennessee. He advertised himself as a, quote, truck driving, shotgun shooting, Bible reading, crime fi fighting, family loving country boy. And this guy was a Democrat, <laughs> okay? Um, he actually lost that race, but it just goes to show you how potent a political symbol that pickup trucks have really, uh, really become. And finally, another political symbol, if you will, an environmental symbol. This is the Prius, first introduced in Japan in 1997. Uh, it came to the U.S. in 2000. It really took off in 2003 when the, the version you see here is a bigger version with distinctive styling that everyone knew you were driving a hybrid when they saw you in this vehicle. 
And the other thing actually was the, um, uh, it took off as a symbol and the, you know, the Hollywood stars flocked to it. And the, the Oscars of 2003, all these big stars and starlets who had just, you know, been ferried up to the red carpet in huge limousines in the last years earlier, they, they were just clamoring all over themselves to uh, uh, be ferried up, uh, chauffeured up to the red carpet in a Prius. And Toyota was pretty smart about this. They, um, um, they made Priuses available. They, they, they made Priuses available free of charge to the Oscars, so the stars just reveled in that. They also put out a, a bumper sticker called Eat My Voltage, uh, which when senior management saw that, they got a little nervous about it and recalled. Uh, but the Prius, uh, you know, really in 2005, it became a, um, uh, uh, the first year it had 100,000 uh, 100, cars, 100,000 Priuses sold, and it's really become a mainstream vehicle, not a niche vehicle. Uh, one of my favorite uh, episodes in researching this book, I'll, I'll just tell you very briefly. So in the spring of 2007, there's a guy that's arrested on the freeway near San Francisco going more than 100 miles an hour in his Prius. And uh, the fellow who writes the uh, Mr. Roadshow column for the San Jose Mercury News leaped onto this story because the guy who got arrested was named Steve Wozniak, co-founder, of course, of Apple Computer. So uh, Mr. Roadshow... Uh, fires off an email to the Waz and says, hey, is it true you were arrested for going 105 in your Prius? Uh, the Waz fired back an email and said, not true, 104. Okay. Well, this dialogue goes back and forth, and finally Mr. Rocho says, well, how did it feel to be in a Prius going 104 miles an hour? And Wozniak fires back an email that says, well, hey, it was remarkably stable. It was kind of like my Hummer. <laughs> So here you have a guy that has a Prius and a Hummer. I'm not quite sure where that comes off symbolically, but it was pretty funny. Um, uh, the other thing I'm just going to end with right here is a quote from the, uh, the uh, uh, during the 2008 presidential campaign, a quote from the Portland, Oregon uh, Mercury, a weekly newspaper, uh, and it went like this. Uh, a guy wrote in and said, so you own a Prius. You compost, you recycle, you have reusable shopping bags, for your short drives to Whole Foods. You are the best. So, do we really need the Obama sticker? <laughs> so you can see how all these things took on political symbols. Uh, anyway, those are the 15 cars that, at least in my view, had, some, um, um, had a real, some, real important impact on how we live and think as a people. Um, so I, um, I, hope, uh, I hope this has helped you understand at least where I'm coming from on this. And, and I think Bob Casey's going to put some questions to the auto, uh, from the audience to me, so we'll proceed on to that part of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. What's the most influential car in America now? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, th I think uh, uh, I'd have to say it's probably, um, I think it's probably the Prius, if you will. Uh, because uh, even though its you know its sales are not overwhelming, it's really just think. Look at what it spawned. It spawned all this electric and natural gas and hybrids. Uh, there's a whole lot of experimentation going on with alternate fuels. Ironically, one of the reasons that alternate fuels aren't catching on, uh, you know, electric cars and hybrids aren't catching on so much. I mean, I think GM just had to sh uh, furlough the factory in Lansing that builds the Chevy Volt for about a month or so because the Volt was uh, selling slowly, is because the, this new generation of internal combustion engines are remarkably fuel efficient. You can get a four-cylinder naturally aspirated gasoline engine uh, in a, in a decent-sized car that gets 42 miles a gallon on the highway. And so people are sort of saying, gee, with that kind of mileage, why do I need to get a hybrid or an electric and pay the extra price for it? But all that work was really spawned by the success of the Prius. So I'd say the Prius. For the cars in your book, um, what influence did automotive marketing play in the effect cars had in society as, to, as opposed to other societal factors? Well, I think automotive marketing played a huge factor in the, um, it, certainly in the success of the Volkswagen um, 
uh, Volkswagen uh, Beetle. You know, the, the, all these advertisements I was showing you about the Beetle, you know, it was the only thing to do uh, when the, uh, after the mule died. Uh, the advertisement that said lemon. There's another advertisement that was a classic I didn't show you, but it had a Beetle sitting out on a, in front of a prosperous suburban home with a white picket fence. And the headline is, what year car do the Joneses drive? Well, of course, you couldn't tell because, right, because the Beatles all look the same from year to year. So all this was very clever anti-establishment marketing. But here's the dirty little secret behind all that. The company that produced that advertising was not a really hip place to work. It was very Germanic. Um, in fact, I, I talked to one guy, it's a little episode in the book, um, and this is probably a little unfair. He was a little caustic and probably a little bitter, but he said, um, uh, you know, he was vying for a promotion once with one of his colleagues who was German, a German posted in America. And he said, uh, look, we both raised our hands for the job, but I forgot to say Sieg Heil. Okay, it's a little caustic, but the po point is Volkswagen as a company was a very button-down uh, place, very proper traditional business place, but the marketing was very hip, irreverent. So I think it had a huge impact, and that's just one example. Uh, here's another political-related question. Can you discuss the unusual connection between American Motors and the 2012 presidential race? I'm sorry, what was the question again? The, uh, can you discuss the unusual connection uh, between American Motors and the 2012 presidential race? Well, yeah, I think, you know, obviously that relates to the presumptive Republican nominee, Mitt Romney, being the son of George Romney, who was the... Um, uh, uh, really the, the, the leading CEO, the most famous CEO of American Motors, George Romney actually invented the term compact car uh, with the Rambler. Um, if some of you might remember Ramblers from the late 1950s. So he, he actually invented the term compact car. Uh, so really, I mean, you know, Mitt Romney grew up in an automotive house, household, an AMC household. Uh, so there's a direct connection that way. The, um, you know, this is, this is a little bit of a sidelight, not directly related to the question, but one of the cars that I really seriously consider putting in the book, but just I just thought, you know, I gotta, I gotta limit this to 15, was the AMC Gremlin. Because nothing quite symbolized the, you know, the futility of the Jimmy Carter 70s as much as the Gremlin, I think. I remember the old joke about, you know, what, what, what happened to the rest of your car, you know, because it had that chopped off back. That car was actually um, uh, designed by a guy named Dick Teague. Uh, it was, the design was first sketched out on the back of a Northwest Airlines air sickness bag. I kid me not. And it was introduced on April Fool's Day, 1970. So it, it, I, I just couldn't resist all that. And that's all mentioned in the book, but I didn't choose the gremlin. The other, the other thing about this, just real quickly, is uh, whether Mr. Romney, how is he, how is he going to square his opposition to the, to the federal bailout of General Motors and Chrysler uh, with, you know, the race here in Michigan and Ohio, Ohio being probably more of a swing state in Michigan. So that, that's going to have, that whole episode, his stance on that could have a major impact on this race, if the race is close. I think one of the other things they, they sort of refer to here somewhat cryptically is American Motors and the Hummer. And I, I think they're referring to the fact that, and, and it may be the sort of irony, as you say, uh, George Romney really coined the term compact car. Uh, American Motors actually was the people who produced the original Hummer, the Humvee, the military vehicle that replaced the Jeep, ironically. Um, and, and then it was a spin-off of American Motors that uh, was also making the civilian Hummer. And then that eventually got and I forget the precise pa path by which that ultimately ended up being produced by General Motors. So, so I, sort of ironically, American Motors had a connection both to the original compact car and to the Hummer, which became the sort of symbol of, uh, at least our current symbol of automotive excess. Well, that's, that's a good point, Bob. You know, it, it, you know, in a sense, the Hummer was sort of like the tail fins of the uh, tail fins of the 50s, in a sense, the symbol symbol of the excess. I think one of the interesting things, of course, is that when you take Jeep and Hummer, there's a, there's a couple of real parallels here. Both had their roots at American Motors, but the other parallel that I find amusing is both were named, both derived their names from acro acronyms. So, you know, Jeep was GP vehicle, general purpose vehicle. Hummer was. Um, <sighs> H U Humvee, which stood for 
you know, some sort of military vehicle, blah, blah, blah. It's a, it was a much longer tangled acronym, which just shows me that ever since World War II, acronyms, like everything else in life, has gotten a lot more complicated. Um, and you've, you've addressed this somewhat, but uh, uh, the question is, do you, what do you foresee as the next breakthrough car in, uh, 19, in 2015 to 2020? And you're, you're suggesting it may not be a breakthrough, a particular, uh, particular vehicle at all. It may be something more systemic like the, uh, like the zip car. Yeah, it could be something that's really more of a car merchandising concept. Built, you know, it really sort of brings people and automobiles together in a community. I mean, creating communities is a big thing that happens online, and um, you know that could be. A, and you know, who knows? I mean, it's probably too early to do in 2015 or 20. But you know, all this experimentation out in Silicon Valley that cars that drive themselves. I mean, I mean, just think if you had a car that drives itself, you could drink and drive or whatever. Um, reminds me of that famous line from Dean Martin years ago, if you drink, don't drive, don't even putt. He was good, by the way. <laughs> well, what were, you mentioned some of the other vehicles like the Gremlin that you talked about, uh, considered as possibly for this book. What were some of the other vehicles that you considered and ultimately uh, decided to forego for the book? I'm gonna get beat up on this from a lot of people, you know, both here and, and automotive enthusiasts nationwide, Bob, but, uh, one that I really agonized about for a while was the 57 Chevy, uh, Ed Cole's iconic uh, car, uh, beautiful automobile with, a, with you know, that, that small block V8, and it really made driving passionate and fun and, and all that. But, you know, you can only pick a certain number of cars from, from a certain era. And to me, the, the, the exuberance of the 50s, the sky's the limit ethos of the 50s, really was more captured by the, first the Corvette and then by tail fins that have lived on to become uh, symbolic. And um, so I had to leave that out. I also considered the Ford Taurus. Uh, remember when that came out in the fall of 85, the 86 Taurus? But I decided in the end the Taurus was, um, uh, the Taurus really was a more important car for the industry and for Ford Motor than it was for society, uh, partly because Ford really walked away from it for a few years. Um, this is a question actually that I can answer. It's, uh, they're asking about one of the cars that's in our automotive exhibit. What's the history of the 1962 Mustang sports car on display? Um, that car was created actually as a concept car for Ford. Uh, they were looking to uh, generate uh, what they would call today buzz. Uh, they wanted something that would, Ford, Ford in the early 60s was still seen as a little bit stodgy company. They're trying to catch in on that youth market. And uh, that little two-seater Mustang was designed to go to car shows and racetracks. It was fully operational um, to be a car that um, uh, would catch the eye of young people. They, they took it on a tour of colleges and, and, and got uh, ideas. And of course, that's the origin of the name Mustang. And as Paul said, they were originally thinking about the P-51 uh, fighter plane from World War II, they then decided that maybe that reference was a little more obscure for their target audience than, uh, than they liked, so they, they settled on the horse, the running horse logo, and, and the horse as the, uh, as the Mustang as a, as a symbol of a horse. Uh, but that was the idea, and then when, uh, when the production Mustang came out, why they, they sort of had this built-in uh, audience that and I was in college at the time, and I thought, boy, that, that you know, that if Ford built something like that little Mustang, that'd be great. Well, it didn't, really. But um, it's what today we would call a halo car. Uh, it cast this warm glow over the whole Ford, uh, Ford lineup of cars and over the whole company. So that's, that's the origin of that car. But just before you go on to the next question, so I think it's just fascinating in Bob's answer just how much words have evolved over the years. Uh, so he talked about, he said what we, what we call today buzz, when you talked about uh, the, the 62 Mustang concept car. You know, back then, buzz was meant something was wrong with your engine, okay? Now it, it's a good thing. Buzz is like, you know, the word is spreading and all that sort of thing. So it's just remarkable not only how cars have evolved, but how language has evolved. Um, yesterday came the word that uh, the legendary Carol Shelby passed away. 
um, and uh, he, he died on Thursday. Uh, and the question is, did you ever meet Carol Shelby, and uh, what are your thoughts about him? Yeah, I've met Carol Shelby several times, uh, you know, never in a, um, you know, in a really intimate one-on-one -on -one setting, if you will, but in several group sort of interviews and that sort of thing. You know, he was one of a kind. Uh, he was uh, exuberant. Uh, he had a passion for something he believed in. You know, he basically parlayed his racing career into um, a car that made, let people sort of live their fantasies, if you will, with the, with the Shelby Mustangs. Um, and that's, that's pretty neat. And you think about it, you think a guy like John Peterman of the J. Peterman catalog, um, you know, let people live their fantasies by producing clothing that, you know, would sort of let them um, live the part of something they would never do, like participate in a Wyoming cattle drive, okay? Well, this is really what Carol Shelby did. He produced something that let people uh, live their dreams. He did it with passion, and he became a brand name, a personal brand name because of this, which is really very remarkable. It, it's, it's very remarkable. I, one Carol Shelby story, uh, a few years ago, uh, we did a, ser a whole series of interviews with a number of, of automotive innovators, and we did one with Carol Shelby. And uh, he was in his late 80s by then. He was in, uh, he didn't see well, and uh, he had heart trouble for years. He was running on a transplanted heart. Towards the end of the interview, he was beginning to get kind of tired, and his voice was beginning to crack, and we, were, we wanted to wrap it up. Uh, but we had, he was famous for wearing a black cowboy hat. And so we got the cowboy hat, asked him to bring, get the cowboy hat out, and asked him to tell the story about the cowboy hat. And, and uh, uh, at the very end, uh, uh, he, he told the story about how he'd always worn this cowboy hat, and he thought you know, that, that, that people liked the image, and he put the cowboy hat on. And he had been up to that point, he'd been a little, as I say, he was a little tired, he was kind of leaning back in the chair and his voice was beginning to crack. He put that cowboy hat on and he leaned forward in the chair and then he started telling more stories. And it was, he was, he was a character. He, he assumed he had this public persona um, and and he was he was great when he was talking to us, but boy, when he put that cowboy hat, now he was old shell, and he was the public figure, uh, and it was just it was quite remarkable to see that transformation and to see the way that he uh, um, even uh, kind of divided himself between Carol Shelby, the guy who was talking about his all his businesses, and Carol Shelby in the black cowboy hat, the the, the public figure. Well, you know, um, it reminds me of a, one of the more poignant incidents I had in researching this book. Um, it was on a fall, a very cold fall day, late fall day, that I went to Chicago and went out to Evanston, Illinois, and talked to Don Fry, who was then a professor of emeritus at Northwestern University, one of the three people who originally created the Mustang. He was in his late 80s. His health was failing. During the course of the interview, though, he took me out to the garage and he showed me his original black cherry colored 1964 and a half Mustang and he was 20 years younger immediately. He had a spring in his step, a twinkle in his eye and just the emotions that that automobile produced in him and millions of other people were just testament to its power.